We're in this tent, verse 4, we groan, being burdened. We don't want to be unclothed. We don't want to go off into space and be lost in some cosmic nothingness. We want to reappear clothed so that what is mortal is swallowed up by life. That is the promise. Now, friend, I trust you'll continue to think on what John MacArthur just said and consider your eternal destiny. See if that promise applies to you. Today on Grace to You, John MacArthur has continued his series called The End is Not the End. Now, John, uh, when talking about believers, death, and resurrection, you've said that uh, not only does the eternal destination differ for believers and non-believers, but uh, the moment of death, the experience of passing from this life to the next, is also fundamentally different. Explain what you mean by that. Yes, it's kind of uh, reminiscent of the old Groucho Marx line, um, I'm not afraid of death, I just don't want to be there when it happens. So we don't necessarily fear death uh, as a believer, but we can fear the event. I mean, none of us looks ahead into the future and says, um, I hope I get cancer, I hope I have a heart attack, I hope I have a stroke, I hope I get hit by a car, I hope I'm in a plane that crashes. Uh, we don't think like that. We don't want to think like that. We don't want that kind of ending to our lives. We don't seek for that. So while we don't necessarily look for the event that brings about death, we look for what happens when we die. Death for us is just a passing into eternal life. Whatever might be the, um, the experience, whether it happens in a moment, we don't even know it, maybe suddenly our life is taken away from us, or whether it's a long, drawn-out illness where we have lots of time to think about death and lots of time to interact with the people we love and, and make um, earthly preparations, whatever it is, the death itself is not the thing we look forward to. What we look forward to is where death takes us, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Far better, says the New Testament, to depart and be with Christ. For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. It isn't the painful experience that we seek. It's the life in glory that we seek. And if you're a true believer, you live with that hope of eternal glory. If you don't have that hope, you need to come to Christ, who alone is the source of that hope. And friend, the best place to discover that hope is to get a full picture of it in God's Word. To help you study the Scripture more effectively, pick up a copy of our flagship resource, the MacArthur Study Bible. Do that today as you contact us. Call the toll-free number 1-800-55-GRACE or do it at the website gty.org. This study Bible is available in several English and non-English translations, as well as in True Tone, Genuine Leather, and Premium Calfskin. Prices are reasonable and shipping is free. Order the MacArthur Study Bible and begin digging deep into God's Word. Call 1-800-55-GRACE or go online to shop at gty.org. A friend, if you've been encouraged by John MacArthur's study, The End is Not the End, or if perhaps an online resource has helped you prepare for uh, teaching in your church or in a small group, uh, perhaps someone you know has confessed faith in Christ after hearing one of our broadcasts, you know, we'd love to hear that story. Send us your feedback by email to letters at gty.org or drop us a note in the mail to Grace to You. Post Office Box 4000, Panorama City, California, 91412. Remember, you can also leave your feedback or pick up a copy of the MacArthur Study Bible when you go online to gty.org. For John MacArthur, I'm Carl Miller. Thanks for listening today. Please come back tomorrow for the last installment of John's study, The End is Not the End, another half hour of unleashing God's truth, one verse at a time on Grace to You. Hey there, before I'm that I have with you today, which I take very seriously, 
is continue in the conversation that we started last week. All right? I want to continue on this path that we, we took. We only really took a few steps last week down this path. Let me tell you, there's so much to this that God is showing me. And don't worry if you weren't here last week. You're like, oh no, now I'm missing out. I won't know what you're talking about. You will. You'll pick right up because I want to go into a very familiar scripture today. And I thank you, worship team. Y'all can be seated. I want to go to John chapter 4. Yeah. Y'all were clapping? Y'all like the worship? Yeah. Now sit down. All right. Thanks, y'all. I want to go to John chapter 4. Sharing with you some thoughts on the hard work of happiness. On the hard work of happiness. And I think I told you last week that this came to me while I was riding a bike. <laughs> but then, you know, you look all over the Bible and you just see. Now, not all of my sermons start from a Bible passage, and I should be honest with you. Um, I think that the best sermons, they, they feel more like real life, not just like the library. So we don't just want to approach things from an intellectual point of view. Some people think that something is more spiritual if it's more intellectual. I say, oh, that was really deep what you said. Well, what does it mean? I don't know. But it was deep. How do you know? Because I didn't understand it. It was deep. We used to have a staff member who would get up on stage, and Holly said he had the spiritual gift of confusing her. She said, when he talks, he always makes me think that I don't get it. I don't really think he gets it. So I think by him making me not get it and making me think that he's got something deep to say, he circumvents the fact that he didn't study by just saying stuff that sounds so abstract that I think, well, I guess that's why I made a on my SAT, because I don't understand this. But in the Scripture, in John chapter 4, there's, there's a passage, a story that is well-loved and well-worn, and as familiar as it is, I want us to get into it today. And there's something that the Lord is speaking on the subject of the hard work of happiness. And before I read you my Scripture, let me tell you the quote that actually gave me that phrase, okay? It's not a Bible verse that says the hard work of happiness. I was watching a documentary, and that quote came up. The person said, it's something that took me to age 70 to realize that happiness is really hard work. And me and Holly were watching the same movie at the same time, and I looked over at her, and she didn't look like it really registered at all at a deep level. Because like I told you last week, she's naturally happy. I don't mean she doesn't work hard at it. She tries not to complain. She serves others. She does a lot of habits that make her happy. But she's more hardwired for happiness than me. I figured that out in our marriage. Uh, one marriage advice somebody said in every marriage, there's the crazy one. Make sure that you're the crazy one in the relationship before you get married. It'll go easier for you. And when Holly teaches her study on marriage, Mrs. Better Half, and becoming Mrs. Better Half, she's not bragging like, oh, I'm the better half. But I certainly would say that of her. And in my life, it's been, it's been hard work to actually be happy. And hard work I'm good at, and happiness not so much. And you know, after I preached that last week, I went home and said, Did they hear what I said? What I was trying to say? And it's hard to know sometimes. A lot of times I think my sermons are a lot deeper than you think they are. Like I'll preach a whole sermon with all these Greek words or you know, these insights in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and then the people will come up to me and say, that was a funny story about the toilet getting clogged up there at the end. That was good. I like that. <laughs> One time I preached on Ruth and Boaz, and man, I studied the whole Testament to preach that message, and they said, it's good you're finally getting the kids a dog. So it's the one thing you heard, you know, is right there on the surface. So, all that being said as a setup, the person who said that in the documentary was Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys. I defy you to name me a happier sounding band than the Beach Boys. That was the sound of my childhood. 
This is literally the man that was singing, we'll have fun, 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 till her daddy took the T-bird away. And yet his struggles are well documented now with mental illness and drug abuse. And he said something that was quoted. You know, it took me 70 years. He sold a hundred million albums, the Beach Boys have. He wrote uh, what Paul McCartney said is the greatest song ever written. God only knows what I'd be without you. He wrote good vibrations for Pete's sake. And to know that as he was creating these masterpieces of music, that he was saying things like it was three weeks in my bed wondering if I wanted to live. Now, apart from analyzing that specific situation, I just want to take that idea and talk to you about it for a few minutes, that it is possible for you to make happy music and have a troubled mind, that it is possible for you to have memorized Scripture and have a troubled soul, that it is possible for you to be sober. You know, free from some substances that you used to struggle with, but yet deep down, and this is what I want to talk about a little deeper down today from John chapter 4, do we really experience what Jesus came to give us? Do we really? And to look at that, we're going to go into John chapter 4. This story is about I'm testing y'all out to see how much I need to cover. Sounds like I need to go to the very beginning today. Okay, good, 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 good. That lets me know. This is, what y'all, one of the most famous Bible stories, the woman at the well, the woman in Samaria at the well that Jesus stopped to talk to and changed her life. And so where I, where I want to start today is going to be a little different than where we end up, so just flow with me. Flow with me. Flow with the preacher. Would you please flow with the preacher? Touch your neighbor say, flow with the preacher. Touch your neighbor and say, And it may not be where you thought you was going to get it from, and it may not be who you thought you were going to get it from, but everything I promised you, I will bring it to pass. Lift your hands and open your mouth. Open your mouth. You online, open your mouth. Open your mouth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Act a fool, let it out. Holla, get out of character. We're breaking spirits. We're breaking spirits. We're breaking spirits. We're breaking spirits. Shackling spirits. Limiting spirits. Handcuffed spirits. They're broken by the power of God. The spirit of heaviness. It's a spirit. It's a demon spirit. It's a spirit of heaviness. It's a spirit of heaviness. And it's got to break. I forbid it to get in the car with you. There's no room in your car for that spirit. You have to leave that spirit in this building. You have to leave that spirit today with this message. You have to leave that spirit today. It's delayed gratification, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen. There will be a tomorrow. The sun will come out again. The blessings will overtake you. The promises of God are yea and amen. God will get you through this. God will take you through this. 
God will encourage you. God will uplift you. Who am I talking to? Make some noise if I'm talking to you. If I'm talking to you, let me hear from you. Doc, I was preaching. I was preaching, it's been about a few years ago, and I was preaching on the hundredfold return. And I was just preaching it because the Lord gave it to me to preach. And I got in the elevator to go upstairs to change. I was wet. And the Lord said to me, I've given you a hundredfold return. And I said, no, you ain't. Because I thought if I had a hundredfold return, I would know it. He said, yes, I have. I said, Lord, I ain't got no hundredfold return now. He said, you have it. And then he said to me, go get your house of praise. And when I had my house of praise, it appraised for a hundred percent more. than what I paid for it. I told my wife, we got to move. <laughs> we sold that house for 100% more than what I paid for it. What am I telling you? God will often hide your return. I didn't even know I had it. I didn't even know I had it. I didn't even know I had it because I was looking at money. I wasn't looking at the equity that had accrued while I had been enduring. I speak a hundredfold return over your life. I speak a hundredfold return over your life in money in wisdom in favor in spirit in unction i speak a hundredfold return in energy i speak a hundredfold return in your health and your well-being i speak a hundredfold return you watching on the internet turn that camera on me a hundredfold return a hundredfold return in your life in your life it may not come in the form you're expecting it but search for it search for it when god says he's gonna do it he's gonna do it he did it i had to look for it it was right up under my nose Almost every blessing you see in the Bible was in their house. The pot of oil was in the house. The handful of meal was in the house. The blessing is in your house. A hundredfold. Am I telling the truth, honey? A hundredfold return. You ain't never seen such packing in all your life. You know why I had to pack? There is a time limit on a blessing. You have to move in the moment or you miss it. I was going up in the elevator. The anointing was on that moment. I had to cease that moment. We had to be willing to move right then before the door closed. There's a time limit on this blessing. A hundredfold return. I want you to write me about it. I want you to text me about it. I want you to tweet me about it. A hundredfold return. If some of you is going to come through a relationship that you've had and you've underutilized, you didn't even understand that God's going to bring something out of that relationship that's more than what you expected. Some of it's going to come through property. Some of it's going to come through exposure. But God is getting ready to add increase to your life. Increase to your life. 
I speak promotion over your life. I speak promotion over your life. You receive it. Come on. I speak promotion over your life. I speak promotion over your life. I speak promotion over your life. And you that have waited the longest are going to reap the greatest. Do something with me. Everyone that can. Everyone that can. If you can't do it, don't get mad. In 2018, it was reported there was a dramatic rise in the number of cases of demonic possession. For many of the most disturbing cases, Father Carlos Martins was often summoned. I have seen things, very evil things. I order you to go in the name of Christ. I'm not leaving. We've been together too long. He needs me. Listen to The Exorcist Files on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. What's up, y'all? I'm Guillermo Diaz, and I played Huck on Scandal. And I'm Katie Lowe's, a.k.a. Quinn Perkins, and we're the hosts of Unpacking the Toolbox, the Scandal Rewatch podcast where we're talking about all the best moments of the show. With guests like Tony Goldwyn, who always amped up the fire as President Fitzgerald Grant. Grab your Scandal swag, your dubele, and join us on Unpacking the Toolbox every Thursday. Listen to Unpacking the Toolbox on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Alphabet Boys is a new podcast series that goes inside undercover investigations. In the first season, we're diving into an FBI investigation of the 2020 protests. It involves a cigar-smoking mystery man who drives a silver hearse. And inside this hearse was like a lot of guns. But are federal agents catching bad guys or creating them? He was just waiting for me to set the date, the time, and then for sure he was trying to get it to happen. Listen to Alphabet Boys on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up at the top of the hour, Vice President Kamala Harris will be our special guest. And we cannot yes. wait for yes. that, let me tell yes. you. <laughs> yes! <laughs> but, <laughs> but right now, it is time to ask the CLO, Chief Love Officer Steve Harvey. Here we go. Shell in Detroit writes, I'm 40 years old and divorced. My ex-husband cheated on me and he can't deal with the guilt of hurting me. He still cuts my yard and pays my HOA fees and my utilities. He also has my car detailed at my home every other week. It's annoying and I want it to stop. Am I going to have to move to get rid of him? Girl, you're tripping. Oh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? This is perfect. You heard, Carla. Girl, you tripping. <laughs> What's wrong? You get your yard cut. You get your homeowner association dues paid. What? He details your car. That right there. He messed up. <laughs> yeah. He still love you. It's annoying to you, you know? Well, let me ask you something. At least with this annoyance, there is some benefits. Mm. Yes, there you yeah. go. Mm-hmm. You're going to mess around me, the man that's just going to annoy your ass. And that's Come on, it. Uh huh. So, you know, he yeah. know he Come messed on, up. Shell. He in deep regret. He lost Trying. best thing he ever had, messing around with something he ain't even want. You know, mm-hmm. y'all might could get this thing back together. I don't know. You might, you know, depending on, but don't seem like you want to at all. But. Yeah, she wants to get rid of him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's done. <laughs> Yeah, she might go so far as to move. <laughs> All right, moving on to Valerie in Houston. I know it's a perfect setup. Valerie in Houston says, I'm the youngest of four siblings, and they're all married with a, uh, a total of 12 children. I'm 28 and single with a small savings account. As the auntie, my siblings expect me to buy stuff for their kids' birthdays, for Christmas, and then support all of their school's fundraisers. Would it be wrong to start telling them no? Well, you know, do birthdays. You got to go old school. Birthday, you get a card, Uh and you get a dollar of however old you are. Oh, okay. That that is old school. You're right. Uh Christmas. If you're four, you get $4. Christmas. Uh Get a family game, give it to all of them. (laughs) A board game. (laughs) Merry Christmas to the kids. (laughs) You know. And that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. But uh, supporting their fundraisers, you know, quit just, you know, go vegan. You ain't got to eat no more Girl Scout cookies. (laughs) You know, and all this here. You know, (laughs) buy all this stuff. That's all you got to do. You know, just you got to start lying. Uh, See, they done had all these babies now. They want you to help pay for them. We ain't finna do all that. 
Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. so you you know, stop letting people guilt you into stuff. Guilt that's is right. the most useless emotion in the world. It serves nobody except the person that's applying it. And yeah. guilt usually turns into manipulation. Mm-hmm. 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 Blackmail, all of that. All right. Thank you, CLO. That was good. Uh, Milani in St. Philly says, I booked a couple's massage for my mom and I so we could be in the same room. We both requested a male to do our massages. I told my mother to leave her panties on, but as soon as we got in the room, I saw that she was naked. Uh, She flirted with the poor guy (laughs) the entire time. How do I control a 60-year-old vixen? Let them draws go. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> see, the problem is, I think her mama look like a mama. <laughs> them some big draws. Them big draws. Yeah. Them wasn't no. Them wasn't a thong or nothing. No. <laughs> them draws. They had to move it. One. He was you. The male. Uh. 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 Masseuse, Masseuse was using the draws as a uh, as a throw rug on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> really. <Yeah. laughs> How do you Got even ask your mom? draws with them lint balls on it. Mama, can uh-huh. you keep your panties on? You don't tell me to keep your panties. How you think you got here? <laughs> exactly. How do you? Yeah. <sighs> so there's no, controlling, there's no controlling 60-year-old mom. No. The victim. just said that naked. Uh, <laughs> naked. You know what yeah. that look like? You know what that look like? Harder <laughs> right here. <laughs> Up on the table. <laughs> Wow. My, my back. <laughs> Mama. Put that blanket on, please. Mama. Oops, you fell out. When she, on. When she had to turn over. <laughs> All right. Oh All right, God. moving on. This is the last one, Steve. <laughs> Brittany in Studio City says, my roommate and I have lived together for a year and it worked out fine because she's an introvert. We're not the best of friends, but we hang out. She told me she's going to elope with the man she met online. I'm worried that he will try to move in with us. Should I make plans to move or talk to her first? Now this wow. is her mama? No, no, no. This is her roommate. Mama was Her black. roommate? Yeah, her roommate met a guy online that she wants to marry. Now, now, now the the other roommate is afraid that she's going to bring this guy. Oh, you got to get out. With, you got to get yeah. out. This is mm-hmm. foolishness. You need to let mm-hmm. what all going to happen need to just happen to her. Listen to me. Somebody has going to have to talk to the news reporters and the police. You know and, what? And I've always thought that should be me. <laughs> I've never thought that I should be the point of discussion. I always try to put myself in a position where I'm talking to the reporters and the police. I don't ever mm-hmm. want to be the subject of the reporter and the police. <laughs> right. Yeah. True. Yeah. So right. I True. try. I would distance uh-huh. myself and clear myself so I could go on it. Because somebody going to have to tell her side story. You know, when she went on, I told her. I told <laughs> her. <laughs> to have him come. And I miss her so much. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Is there a scientific consensus behind the 98% claim? In fact, a number of epidemiologists and infectious disease experts and officials dispute that we need a number anywhere near it. Even those who are pro-mandate, like Dr. Monica Gandhi, professor of clinical medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, believes that, quote, there is no evidence that we need that high of a vaccination rate, 98%, to get back to normal, close quote. Other countries, like Denmark, have opted for a 74% vaccination rate as acceptable in order to lift certain restrictions, especially if the most vulnerable are vaccinated at a higher rate. Norway lifted all restrictions when it got to a 67% vaccination rate. The point here is that the science is shifting, sometimes by the day. It is reasonable for people who notice this to feel concerned about it, and it is, at the very least, churlish to present them as merely irrational. The second justification for mandates is that the state has an obligation to protect those who cannot protect themselves from an infectious disease passed on to them by others, i.e. the unvaccinated do not have a right to quote, recklessly endanger, close quote, and infect others. But as many have pointed out, it is hard to describe our current moment quite this way 
since vaccines and now boosters are freely and widely available so people can protect themselves if they wish. Of course, this reveals the real problem which is that vaccinated people do not, in fact, get comprehensive immunity, as in the case, for example, of the polio or measles vaccines. And on this, there is increasing scientific agreement. We can't eradicate this mutating virus at this point. It is likely not a case like smallpox, which was eradicated because both the virus and the vaccines met a host of criteria. Donald Ainsley Henderson, who directed the WHO smallpox eradication campaign, wrote that smallpox was uniquely suited for eradication because it didn't exist in animal reservoirs, it was easy to identify cases in even the smallest villages by its distinctive awful rash, so a test for it wasn't needed, the vaccine gave immunity that lasted a decade, and natural immunity was easy to identify by the scars smallpox left. COVID satisfies none of these conditions. Quote, if we are forced to choose a vaccine that gives only one year of protection, close quote, said Larry Brilliant, an epidemiologist also involved in smallpox elimination, quote, then we are doomed to have COVID become endemic, an infection that is always with us, close quote. He and five other scientists have since argued together that COVID is not going away because it's growing in a dozen animal species, and variants allow it to pop up in places that once beat it back. Indeed, this is the reason that some scientists argue we need over 90% of people vaccinated to keep America safe from a virus that will ping pong around the unvaccinated parts of the globe for years. As Brilliant and colleagues wrote recently, quote, among humans, global herd immunity once promoted as a singular solution, is unreachable." Close quote. So, if it's correct that we can't eradicate the virus and we can't get lasting vaccine-induced herd immunity, what is our goal? It would be, to use Monica Gandhi's phrase, to get back to normal. It would mean accepting some natural herd immunity and putting more focus on saving lives by other means alongside vaccines, including better outpatient medications to catch COVID early and keep people out of the hospital, lowering our individual risk factors, and speeding delivery of vaccines to the highly vulnerable when an outbreak occurs and prioritizing them over people who are already immune. That the justifications originally given for mass public mandates are so weakened is one of COVID's many unexpected challenges, one that requires flexible thinking, new kinds of planning, and above all, acknowledgement, lest its denial becomes yet another example of bungled trust. In tackling the trust problem generally, we can return to the two kinds of public health systems, the coercive and the participatory. The United States has all sorts of mandates, but also continues to have significantly high rates of vaccine hesitancy and vaccine avoidance. In contrast, Sweden is the leading example of a participatory public health model. Quote, Sweden has one of the highest vaccination rates in the world and the highest confidence in vaccines in the world, but there's absolutely no mandate Koldorf, again, one of the world's leading epidemiologists and a specialist in vaccine safety and consultant to the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccine Safety Technical Subgroup, notes, quote, if you want to have high confidence in vaccines, it has to be voluntary. If you force something on people, if you coerce somebody to do something, that can backfire. Public health has to be based on trust. If public health officials want the public to trust them, public health officials also have to trust the public. Close quote. Just as pharma's indemnification removed its incentive to improve safety, so do mandates remove public health's incentive to have better 
more consistent communication to listen, understand, educate, and persuade, which is what builds trust. Kaldorf is echoed by Demania, who is by my estimate one of the most effective persuaders of the vaccine hesitant. Quote, I've been so wrong in the past about things, close quote, he noted in the video. Quote, I actually, at one point in my career, felt that shaming anti-vaxxers was a good idea because they were so dangerous to children. This was pre-pandemic stuff, and it never works to convince anti-vaxxers. I would rarely ever get emails from people saying, hey, I was on the fence and you convinced me with your crazy rant about how stupid anti-vaxxers are. Then I started to wake up a bit. Why is it people feel the way they do? And when you really dig into it, you go, I can empathize with that. Actually, we share the same goal, which is our kids should be healthy. And you really think this is going to help. So of course you're going to. In fact, I should love you for trying to do the right thing for your kids. Close quote. Indeed, Demonizing people for having doubts is the worst move we can make, especially since there are serious problems in our drug and vaccine regulatory systems. ...or two young pigeons, and come before the Lord to the door of the tent of meeting, and shall give them to the priest, and the priest shall offer them one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord for his discharge. And if a man has an emission of semen, he shall bathe his whole body in water, and be unclean until the evening. And every garment and every skin on which the semen comes shall be washed with water and will be unclean until the evening. If a man lies with a woman and has an emission of semen, both of them shall bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the evening. Concerning women's bodily discharges. When a woman has a discharge of blood, which is her regular discharge from her body, she shall be in her impurity for seven days. And whoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. And everything upon which she lies during her impurity shall be unclean. Everything also upon which she sits shall be unclean. And whoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever touches anything upon which she sits shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Whether it is the bed or anything upon which she sits, when he touches it, he shall be unclean until the evening. And if any man lies with her, and her impurity is on him, he shall be unclean seven days, and every bed on which he lies shall be unclean. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she shall continue in her uncleanness, as in the days of her impurity she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies all the days of her discharge shall be to her as the bed of her impurity, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanness of her impurity. And whoever touches these things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening. But if she is cleansed of her discharge, she shall count for herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. And on the eighth day she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons, and bring them to the priest to the door of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall offer one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her before the Lord for her unclean discharge. The Law Concerning Discharges Thus you shall keep the sons of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. This is the law for him who has a discharge, and for him who has an emission of semen, becoming unclean thereby. Also for her who is sick with her impurity, that is, for any one, male or female, who has a discharge, and for the man who lies with a woman who is unclean. Psalm 76 Israel's God, judge of all the earth, to the choir master with the stringed instruments, a psalm of Asaph, a song. In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. His abode has been established in Salem, his dwelling place in Zion. There he broke the flashing arrows, the shield, the sword, and the weapons of war. Glorious are you, more majestic than the everlasting mountains. The stout-hearted were stripped of their spoil. They sank into sleep. All the men of war were unable to use their hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both rider and horse lay stunned. But you, you are awesome. 
Who can stand before you once your anger is roused? From the heavens you pronounced judgment. The earth feared and was still when God arose to establish judgment to save all the oppressed of the earth. Surely the wrath of men shall praise you. The residue of wrath you will bind around you. Make your vows to the Lord your God and perform them. Let all around him bring gifts to him who is to be feared, who cuts off the spirit of princes, who is awesome to the kings of the earth. Father in heaven, we give you thanks. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for sharing us, sharing with us uh, your heart and even in your law today, Lord God, even in your law that can seem so um, distant, can seem so dry, can seem so otherworldly and even so confusing. We thank you because it reveals your heart. And we ask that you please continue to reveal your heart to us as we reveal our hearts to you. You are the Lord and we are yours. Help us to be yours more and more every day. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, um, here we are. Uh, that can be a very, very challenging reading we just went through. Uh, the couple readings, in fact. The first one from uh, Exodus chapter 22, less challenging, but kind of more commonsensical, right? And that's, and that's exactly what we're talking about. What is be happening in the readings that we're going to be diving even more deeply into in the next number of days, both with Exodus and Leviticus, are all about the laws, the laws of the people of Israel. And the good news about that is not that uh, this is the, the time where people get hung up. <laughs> the good news is, is not that this is just simply uh, something that's distant from us, but is that this is revealing something about God's heart. So we go back to Exodus chapter 22, right? And we have, here are some social laws. These, these are laws for restitution. These are social and religious laws. And what's happening, remember this, rewind a couple of days, where we heard Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, say, okay, Moses, you're sitting here in judgment all day long, and you're trying to be just to these people. And yet, uh, you're making them wait. And you're putting a burden upon their uh, upon their lives by them having to wait for you to know what is right and what is wrong. And so, you know, collect other people around you who will who will know, who will be able to judge. But here we have written down kind of the principles of judgment. And they're principles according to justice. And this is so, so key. They're principles according to justice. So we have these laws of restitution. So, which and that we talked about before, those laws of restitution have to do with justice, not vengeance. Our hearts are inclined towards vengeance, right? If, if you did that one thing to me, I want to do double back to you. But the laws of justice say, nope, there's a limit. There's a limit here to vengeance. And what's that reveal? It reveals the very heart of God. God who says that he reveals that he is just, that he is justice itself. And so well, as we go through the next couple chapters, I mean, almost for the rest of the book of Exodus, what we're going to see is restraint. What we're going to see is here's what's fair. What we're going to see is, okay, if you want to live in harmony with each other, you have to per pursue justice more than vengeance. And this is going to be the restraint that's placed upon the people of Israel. And we're going to dive more and more deeply into this. Um, so importantly, because it is important to live like this in order to have real community. And that's in you know, Leviticus chapter 15 um, about bodily emissions. We talked about this before, but bodily emissions are important. Why? They're important because the life is in the blood, right? They're important because um, they refer to very intrinsic and necessary parts of our relationships. So... There are four kinds of bodily emissions that are described in Leviticus chapter 15. Two for a man, two for a woman. Uh, for the first one for a man would be basically, would most likely be some kind of like venereal disease type of situation. Uh, the second kind. During the day, I'm dependent, I'm dependent. So just one shift today, just one shift is going to shift everything else. Just from today, very subtle. Even if you say it, stop it and say it again. I choose to do this. Not I cannot live without this. I cannot do without this. No, I am a master. I am the master of my mind. I am the master of my sense organs. And I choose what to do. Once we start practicing this, 
it will become a natural way of living it become a natural way of living then we take it to the next level i create the stress that i'm experiencing right now it's not work stress it's not relationship stress it's not travel stress it is i create the stress work relationship travel exams these are pressures so again keeping the simple formula with you stress is equal to pressure divided by resilience we used to learn this in school stress is equal to pressure divided by resilience pressure is not in my control pressure could be a behavior pressure could be the weather pressure could be covid pressure could be the current situations in the world pressure could even be the health of my body because it's my body again outside to who i am i am the being this is my body so pressure which means challenge in life sometimes could be the health of my body but we cannot say because i am not healthy i am not happy no it's not matter over mind it is mind over matter body may be unwell body may be experiencing a terminal illness and i can be calm and happy because my mind is not dependent on my body this is the truth this is a reality and we've seen everyone around us many of you must have met someone who's going through a chronic ailment and yet very light vibrant happy and someone could just have a little cold cough fever and they say oh i'm not well what to do horrible day bitter experience they can blame just a little cold for not being happy that day people open the windows in the morning and say the weather is so depressive we can't say that then i'm saying i'm feeling low and gloomy because of the weather this is very subtle but it's become our vocabulary and the more we speak that way the more the mind becomes dependent so what is happiness happiness means being emotionally independent emotionally independent physical independence social independence financial independence emotional independence that is power emotional independence is power which means i am emotionally independent calm in a crisis loveful when someone is in pain and not behaving the right way with me respectful and radiating blessings when someone could be using abusive language because they are emotionally unwell right now when someone is not in their right behavior we need to remember they are not doing this to us they're only showing us their state of mind at the moment they're just showing us that they are emotionally in pain and so their words their behavior their energy it reflects their pain their pain could be just as words and sometimes it could be more than that recently a young sister about 30 35 years old she came to learn meditation at the center and she was sitting in the meditation room and when she walked out she just said i've released something that i've held on to for almost 30 years i said what happened and then she shared that she had gone through an experience when she was 5 years old her parents had left the house with her uncle she was 5 years old that time and she experienced abuse and now she was about 35 and she said you know what 35 years i have hated people i can't trust people she chose not to get married not to be in a relationship and she said i can't trust anybody and she said i don't even trust my parents actually and she said i've not had a very good relationship with them for 30 years and she said while i was sitting and contemplating what we have studied today she said i just realized that what i experienced 30 years back was somebody else's mistake but all that they could do was to my body which was horrible but you know what did i do for 30 years to myself 
She said, I held on to hatred for 30 years. I held on to doubt and insecurity for 30 years. She said, what they did was bad. But I think what I did to myself was completely my choice. And today, she said, today I release. I just release what I've held on to because I realize what I've held on to is not what they did. What they did was to my body, but what I held on to was my creation. And I'm not going to live in hurt and pain anymore. That's all. It was just that. One minute of a realization. And that doesn't mean what the other person did was right, not at all. But what it just means is what I was creating here was my choice. What they did was not in my control at that age. But what I did for 30 years was completely my choice. And I chose to create hatred. And she changed her vocabulary immediately. She said, I chose to create hatred. Before that, she was saying, people are horrible. See the shift in the vocabulary. I chose hatred. She said, I chose not to forgive. She said, I chose not to like my parents and blame them for what happened. And then when she started this healing with herself and healing was just an understanding, her relationships with her parents changed because she had released that emotional blockage which she had held to for so long. And when she did that, she suddenly shifted towards being happy. Earlier, she was doing everything the normal way, working She's not innately happy because I cannot be happy when I've held on to something there in my subconscious. I just cannot be happy. So it's a very fundamental thing. I think we should have been taught this when we were in kindergarten. It's very fundamental that people can be here. They can cheat. They can betray. They can abuse. They can use wrong language. But that's because they are emotionally unwell. It's because they are going through something very turbulent inside them. But my thought and feeling, my emotion is my choice. It's my creation. I don't know if he was just riding through the fields one day. I don't know if an apple fell on his head. I don't know what exactly uh, prompted this. But Vala was going, you know, we have a lot of copies of Latin Vulgate. And we keep making copies of Latin Vulgate because we need copies of Latin Vulgate. But Jerome wrote commentaries on pretty much all the books of the Bible. And we don't use Jerome's commentaries all that much. So it would be really interesting to look at Jerome's commentaries and see what text Jerome has in his commentaries and compare that to what we have in Latin Vulgate and see if anything's changed. Because there'd be more steps of copying in the Vulgate than there would be in Jerome's commentaries, which, you know, most people aren't sitting around reading all day long. And so uh, there'd be fewer steps, fewer generations of copying in Jerome's commentaries. And so he set about doing this. Can you imagine what an exciting project that was? Uh, especially when you have, uh, I'm sorry? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay, you're weird. Um, and yeah. so, um, uh, can, you, and can you imagine doing it without electrical lights and, and showers and things like that. I mean, I, I, just, I, I just can't imagine what... what uh, it, control F? Fine. Oh, oh, I was going to say, what? Uh, yeah, it, it, it would have been a, a pretty major project, but people didn't have much else. You know, they didn't, they didn't have to keep checking Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that, so for some reason they got things done. And um, so he, he does this study, and he, he, he finds out, you know what? The Latin Vulgate we have today has been changed. Now, it's not like some, it's like, not, when we say changed, it's not like it was originally about somebody other than Jesus or something, but uh, there, there have been textual corruptions in, in the Vulgate, even in the official version that the church uses. And, but so controversial would have been his conclusions that he refused to publish them because he didn't want to die. Uh, he didn't want to get tied to a stake and be turned into a crispy critter. And he only shared his conclusions with some people, and one of those people that read his work was Desiderius Erasmus, and Erasmus published Vala's work posthumously. 
Uh, and I think under an assumed name, too, because Erasmus didn't want to die either. Um, but this was just, this way of thinking was just coming back. It's not that it had never existed before. The Greeks and Romans understood things like this, but there was a, there's a reason why it's called the Dark Ages. Um, and there was a, a, a collapse of classical education in the vast majority of Europe. And so, anyway, how in the world did I get onto uh, all of that? I, I've forgotten. That was an interesting rabbit trail that we just uh, ran down there, so that, that's fine. Oh, I was talking about the fact that uh, Ignatius, yes. I, wait a minute. Let me, let me make the connection, then I'll answer your question. I was talking about the fact that there are pseudo-Ignatian epistles, and we can recognize them now as not having been written by the true Ignatius. So be careful, again, you'll see people quoting from that material online as if it represents Ignatius, and it really doesn't. The Jehovah's Witnesses have done that. They have a long history of doing that. And uh, you'll see why here in a moment, because of Ignatius' actual teachings being utterly incompatible with anything the Jehovah's Witnesses believe about Jesus. Yes? Are you saying, back to the Jerome commentary, are you saying that within the Jerome commentary, it would quote from the Vulgate, and this would reconstruct the Vulgate? Right. Right. And, and Vala went, wow, this is interesting. Uh, it's changed. <laughs> and, you know, the change is, is due to ecclesiastical usage and, and so on and so forth. But, yeah, he, and to even think that way indicated that the Renaissance was impacting the way that men were thinking. And obviously we know, we'll, we'll talk about this later on, Enlightenment, the Renaissance, positive and negative. Uh, there, were, there were positive results. We, we have much, I think, stronger uh, biblical scholarship as a result, but also negative because it really did lead in, in, in fundamentally in thought uh, to what we see in Europe now, which is a, a fully secular state and a, and a fully secular worldview. Um, so anyway, so what letters do we have? Well, let's see if we've got a... Uh, full list up here that I can just rip them off to you here. Um, no, we don't. So we have, he wrote to the Ephesians, uh, to the Magnesians, uh, to the Trollians, the Romans, the Smyrnians, and to Polycarp. And Philadelphians? Ah, and the Philadelphians. I skipped over it. It's a short one. Lots and lots of stuff worth reading uh, in these letters. But let me just give you some of, the, uh, some of the key ones. In his epistle to Polycarp, and I was reading that last stuff without assistance, but it's not enjoyable. Spend a lot of money on these things. You might as well use them so you can see. Ah, look at that. To Polycarp, um, section 3, Await him that is above every season, the eternal, the invisible, who became visible for our sake, the impalpable, the impassable, who suffered for our sake, who endured in all ways for our sake. Now remember, this is approximately 107 or 108 A.D. So the very beginning of the second century. And almost anywhere you go, especially in public universities, sorry, um, we know, we know about the history of people in public universities. Um, you're going to be told uh, rather confidently, based upon a certain accepted theory, that high views of Christology, high views of Christ developed over time. And in fact, uh, remember, I, I think I've shown you in previous uh, presentations the little manuscript P52. It's just a little, it's about yay big. It's uh, written on both sides. It's from John chapter 18. Uh, back in the 1870s, if you had gone to university in Germany, you would have been told very confidently that scholarship had clearly come to understand that the Gospel of John was written no earlier, or no earlier than 170, 180 A.D. So 150 years after the death of Christ. 
And why? Well, because we understand now the concept of uh, development of theology. Evolution. It was Darwin applied to uh, mental thought. And given the high, high view of Christ in John, we know that took many decades to develop. And so John was not written by a contemporary of Jesus. It had to 